So you burn it at the bottom, gets liquidy in the smoke, and you do the smoke. Okay? You don't put it too long to the go. Boom. It's the fentanyl fix he's been waiting for. BC just got out of jail and is back on the streets. I'd rather do heroin, but I, you don't get off on it. I tried after doing this. You really don't get off on it. Heroin and crack no longer cutting it. Fentanyl, 50 times more potent, fueling the drug overdose crisis sweeping across North America. Small towns and big cities are searching for solutions. And could the answers be right here? This is the heart of Vancouver's downtown east side. Take a look around. It probably looks quite similar to San Francisco's Tenderloin District, a neighborhood plagued by drug overdose deaths, homelessness, and crime. I've seen so many of my friends just about dying, and if I wasn't there, they, they would have died. The number of people dying from drug overdoses tripling over the past five years. Thousands of lives gone from this city. So many people are OD'ing right now, and that is pretty much, you're just another number now. Enter Insight, the first legal safe injection site in North America, established nearly two decades ago, sometimes called a supervised consumption site, a place people can go to use their drugs under the watchful eye of others. Supervised consumption sites, nobody knew how they were going to work. The scientific evidence shows not a single death. From the mayor's office to the back alleys, I'm in Vancouver asking, do safe injection sites work? Could they work in San Francisco? And are these types of harm reduction efforts enough in the face of the deadliest drug overdose crisis either city's ever seen? I can write great short stories. I can write fiction, non-fiction. You can write um, short stories, fiction, non-fiction. Yeah. What I brings would. you to the downtown east side? Well, I'm wired to heroin, which is fentanyl. Meet Small Paul. He's been on the streets since his teens. Tough times at home and some tough breaks leading him into addiction and into a gang. Small Paul, may I ask, how did yeah. you get how did you get addicted to, was it heroin at first? Yeah, well, I'm See, when I was like 16, I got a, I dislocated my knee badly, and then so I've, I've done it like 30 times in my life. And he's still numbing the pains of the past. See the scars there? What are the scars from? Car accident, and from my hernia, and then right here, that right there, there's a 12 gauge from like uh, six feet away, 12 gauge shotgun. A 12 gauge? A gunshot wound from six feet away, and a couple of blocks away, Frank's fighting his own battle. What's your story? Um, about four years I got it out of prison in 2019. Before that, I was um, I'm, well, I'm a dual citizen, so before that, I was back in the states. Um, it's there's some cities that are pretty much going through the same thing down there, even. Uh, but it's not, it's nothing like this. You better not be in a rush. Darwin Fisher knows the streets of Vancouver's downtown east side and the people on them like none other. He's the longtime senior manager at Insight. It's where drug users can go to be supervised while injecting. Insight allows you to actually have real relationships with people who are marginalized almost out of existence in this society. Since opening in 2003, Insight has supervised more than three and a half million individual injections, and there have been more than 6,000 overdoses, all of them reversed. And the healthcare at Insight is, in a sense, so uncontroversial and basic a roof over your head when it's raining, sinks to wash your hands in, clean equipment, life-saving response if you overdose. The goal is to get people out of alleys like this and into a safe place where they can use their drug of choice. You're doing this out here by yourself. Yeah. That's pretty high risk, isn't it? It is in a way, but um, don't take like. I, I have a couple of safeguards in place that I use. JK was a mechanic, injured on the job, 
prescribed Oxycontin, and now he's hooked on fentanyl. The truth is, I came over from Vancouver Island two years ago to, uh, you know, try to get clean. I um, went to treatment, made it about eight months clean. Um, had like a little life situation that I, you know, I guess I'm not really equipped to handle still that well. Is there a reason that you do it back here and not, for example, at the at Insight, at the Safe Injection Oh, site? I go to Insight all the time. Yeah, every day. Yeah. But not every time? No. Yeah, no, they're not open all the time, right? Dr. Patricia Daly is the Chief Medical Health Officer at Vancouver Coastal Health. Most of our services are still in the downtown east side because even with the volume of services we, we have down there, it has the highest rate of overdose death of any neighborhood in the province. And that's because of the concentration of people at risk who live in that neighborhood. Vancouver is now home to three safe injection sites, staffed by nurses and operating under a federal exemption from Canadian drug laws. There are another dozen overdose prevention sites providing a similar service. When uh, someone comes in to access the site, we would sign them in here. Uh, then we would ask what sort of supplies they need. So we'll come over here and gather, um, gather whatever they needed. St. Paul's Hospital is home to one of those sites. A patient would be sitting here at one of our four booths. We would provide them with their supplies and then they would prepare and um, inject their supplies. Ideally, um, we would also be testing their drugs for them so um, they can do that at the beginning or after they've prepared and we can use like a bit of the prepared substance. Have you reversed here? Yeah, we've had um, almost 200 overdoses that we've managed and reversed, varying in severity, but um, yeah, almost 200. And it's reversed always by Narcan? Yeah, we don't always need to use Narcan, so sometimes if it's a more mild overdose with just frequent stimulation and oxygen support, we're able to bring the person back. You're watching Global BC. BC's provincial health officer has declared a public health emergency because of a disturbing spike in overdose deaths. Overdose prevention sites got the go-ahead from the provincial government in 2016. In the first three months of this year alone, the coroner's office reported over 200 deaths. At this rate, the total for 2016 could exceed 700 or even 800. The same year, it declared a state of emergency in response to the drug overdose crisis. A state of emergency still in effect six years later. We know, even though it's been a terrible toll, the number of deaths, over 10,000 people now since the start of the emergency, it probably would have been two and a half, perhaps times higher if we hadn't put in place these services, so it would have been far worse. The latest data shows over a one-year period, 3,200 overdoses were reversed at Vancouver's safe injection and overdose prevention sites. It's much easier to open an overdose prevention site. It's, and most of these are lower barrier. They don't have to meet all the federal requirements. Many are operated by peers who are trained, and yet the results have been just as good. We've seen no deaths in any of those sites. Karen Scott is one of those peer support workers. And, you know, just being able to support somebody in their journey of where they are, meeting them where they're at, you know, because it's not an easy place to say, hey, you can just quit, and you can't. She knows the fear and the frustration all too well, trapped in the cycle of addiction for more than 30 years. In my addiction, I sold myself on the street. I was sliced up by a fellow and left for dead. Fast forward 15 years later, I'm walking down the street and I see this fellow overdosed. I look at him, I recognize him. It's the fellow that sliced me up and left me for dead. I'm a better person. I save him. He thanked me. And I just walked away. I, I could have just said, hey, F you. You tried taking my life. I can take yours right now and not give it back. But that's not who I am. And that's one of the most powerful things that I've ever done. So for us, it was really, really important to create a welcoming space and to hire staff who are really passionate about this and, and wanted to support patients in a non-judgmental way. 
what's the most rewarding part of this job? Seeing somebody come back from an overdose. Actually reversing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think services like safe injection help? They had to do this role. Yeah, if, if, if that wasn't around, it would be absolutely absolute mayhem. Yeah, it's in, it's, it's, there's, they're not a haven for like, for drug dealers and criminals and stuff like that. It's a, they don't, they don't, it's not just safe injection sites. They have uh, medical supplies on hand, nurses, all that stuff. Like, they're more equipped than hospitals are, in some of them. You have a population that struggles to access health care. And now, with Insight, you have them streaming past health care multiple times daily. That means that you don't have to leap on somebody because you see a soft tissue infection brewing. You can be a lot more gentle in the approach, and that's a lot more effective. Um, MRSA is extremely prevalent down here. It's insane. What is that? Uh, like uh, staph infections that are resistant to penicillin or, or most, I, I, I say every second or third person that I know has has it. And small Paul is one of those people. You ever go to Insight? Yeah, yeah of course. They bring up. A lot of times it's hard to get up and go somewhere. Do you think that um, services like Insight, Safe Injection are helping? Oh, 100%. Because, um... I don't want to speak for myself, but you know, they have kept me alive long enough to go get treatment and go try to get, go, go try to get treatment again, right? And that's the thing, one thing I'm, I'm damn sure at is I am not going to quit trying. No matter how many times I relapse, um, no matter how many times I go back out, I'm going to try again because, um, you know, that's the kind of person I am. I'm just not going to give up, right? Even if we're not seeing every user for every injection, there is so much that is gained by going there in terms of better practices, access to nursing care, access to clean equipment, sometimes just access for a moment to somebody who gives a damn about you. Hey man. Hey guys, how are you? Good? Guy Felicella has walked the paths of this park more times than he can count. It's the place he often came to feed his addiction, an addiction he says born out of trauma. Family life uh, it became pretty much unbearable and so I started running away from home and uh, I found the greatest thing I ever found in the world which was uh, street drugs in, back in the day and it changed my life and uh, it gave me the uh, ability to not care what was going on or what people were going to say anymore. The drugs quickly drawing Guy from the suburbs of Vancouver to the downtown east side. Gang life soon followed. The drugs were progressively getting uh, faster and harder. Uh, I quickly started using cocaine and heroin at a very young age. Um, and, you know, multiple years through my juvenile life, I was in youth detention centers, group homes, foster care, you know, in and out, living on the streets. And if Guy wasn't here using in this park, there's a good chance he was at a safe injection site. Records show he accessed Insight more than 4,000 times. There's two lines at the supervised consumption site. One to go and inject drugs and get safer supplies, but also one to go upstairs to the detox. So I've been in both those lines many times, but it was the bridge for me that uh, landed me uh, to actually wanting to, to try it again. And, and I just took, you know, it, it, it took, it, you know, people often say it took me 31 years to actually even like really get a good attempt in at, at, at changing my life. There's not a lot of data on the number of people who access treatment through Insight. A study from 2006 in the New England Journal of Medicine shows about 18% of people accessing Insight will at some point go into detox treatment. Originally, people were like, why are you putting a, a recovery program on top of a shooting gallery? It makes perfect sense. These are people who are not only struggle to access our, our regular medical care system, and usually to, through the emergency room, which is the, the least effective and cost effective way, but they also struggle to access recovery programs because they're just not geared to people who are on the street on the edge of survival. I survived decades of being homeless on the streets. 
and I've also survived six overdoses, which occurred from 2012 to 2013 in a nine month time frame. Um, and the last overdose was February 18th, 2013 at the supervised consumption site. Describing that day at Insight, that overdose as the one that changed everything. I was gone for about seven minutes. At that time, it was one of the long, it was, it was the longest overdose that they had seen. It took me about 10 minutes to come to. And when I came to, I, I look over and the nurse has tears in her eyes. And I just look at her and I'm like, why are you crying? And she says, because I care. And boom, I just melted. And I uh, just said, uh, I just said, I, 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 I need help. And that's exactly what Guy got, a connection to treatment and a start on his recovery. I needed to be on uh, methadone for uh, nine months. I was on it. Uh, and it just gave me the ability to try new things without being so hell-bent on using the substance because I, I use drugs for good days, bad days, ha sad days, happy days. From methadone to mental health, Guy was diagnosed with ADHD and began delving into therapy. And so the hardest thing in my life wasn't getting off the drugs. The hardest thing in my life was actually working through all the insecurities and the pain and just how I viewed myself uh, for so long to be able to, to be the person that I am today. It's all about recognizing people's humanity. The crisis is that we're not recognizing the humanity of people who are using drugs, who are using drugs often because they are suffering, often because they have nowhere to turn. Guy turning to Darwin in this letter, penned from prison 10 years ago, a message of resilience and gratitude. What's powerful about the supervised consumption side is this can, this can happen to anybody. But my kids wouldn't exist if it didn't exist. They wouldn't be alive today. Like, my recovery wouldn't exist. I'd be dead. And even people who have gone on to other things and left the area and, and put different lives together, still, I still hear from them and they still feel a tremendous amount of loyalty to people who were there for them when nobody else was. Guy's life is now centered around sharing his story, his struggle with addiction with others. You know, I, I wasted a lot of mistakes and now I've, I've learned from my past mistakes. And so, you know, my goal in life is to pass that on to others so that they don't have to go through the same pain that I went through. What does it feel like for you guys to be back in the spot where you came to so many times to get high? Well, I mean, it was comforting. I think, you know, it was a spot that I came to because I felt uh, a little bit safer than other spots. And so, you know, every time I, I do walk through it, uh, you know, I just remember there was a time that I'd, I'd, once, uh, I'd once used here, you know. And with every step toward the future are reminders of the past. People on East Hastings Street, the pulse of Vancouver's downtown east side, and a place Guy knows so well. What do you think when you walk down Hastings? Well, I mean, the drug supply, the way it is today, is just killing people. So that, that's the, the heartbreak. Uh, you know, I've lost so many friends uh, to, to, to this madness. They say that six to seven people die every day from opiate overdoses in BC. You know, and paramedics are responding to all those calls. I mean, that's the ones we know about. Troy Clifford is the president of the Ambulance Paramedics of British Columbia. When you talk about fentanyl and carfentanil, the, the extreme potency, um, you, know, you know, some of it's so strong that just the smell of it can cause an overdose, right? Fentanyl's grip on Vancouver's illicit drug market, sending overdose deaths soaring. In 2012, 65 people died from a drug overdose in Vancouver. In 2021, that number was more than 530. That is nearly nine times more people dying in less than a decade. We used to use 0.4 milligrams of Narcan to revive somebody that's overdosed, and now you could use 
a couple milliliters easy and still not revive them. So it's taken longer to revive them, and in some cases we don't. And making these streets even more deadly are benzodiazepines, also known as benzos. Powerful sedatives like Valium and Xanax are being laced into fentanyl, and the high cannot be reversed by Narcan. There's benzos now, which doesn't respond to Narcan medicine. How is, what can you do in a case where you don't have that option for the reversing? Uh, so if we can't reverse it, it would be to protect their airway, keep them safe and get them to a higher level of care, meaning definitively the hospital emergency room. I don't even try Narcanning them anymore. You basically said to stop them from throwing up and choking on their own vomit. And it's just basically, I basically had to sit with them for four or five hours and just make sure that they don't puke and aspirate their own vomit. Sometimes there's benzos in it without yeah. you knowing? Yeah, like oh, someone will give me a hood or something, or like um, I'll smash it, it's already made up, and I'm like, yeah. But uh, I'll do it right because I'm not a generation, and uh, that happens, and uh, boom, out, and we're like, yeah. and all this snot comes up my nose, and we're like, yeah, it's just gross, man. Does the toxic supply worry you? Like bad drugs? Yeah. Like, uh, I think a lot of us try our, our hardest to get as good as drugs as possible. Matt's been on the streets for a few years and says people watch out for one another. Yeah. And what is your name? Tyler. Say, can you say it again? Tyler. Tyler. Nice to meet both of you guys. And that faith seems to override any fear. So you're helping him prepare it? Yeah. And what is this? Side. Uh, Matt has tried getting off these street drugs. Being wired to it mentally, physically, like, it's just, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. You have to have a serious, like, life-changing, like, you have a baby or you have something, it has to be something that you need to, you need to quit for. Is that how you feel? Like, there's just nothing motivating you to stop? Well, I, I am motivated to stop. I have, I have, like, my own kind of reasons and, I want to, I want to get somewhere in life. So I see that this is kind of like a constant cycle that we just keep repeating, repeating every day. Have you tried accessing any of the services? Um, I've done detox a couple times. Matt, one more question before you go. Do you worry about dying? Why? Um, I'm confident that I'm, I'm being safe for nothing. It would have to be like a very miraculous like a fluke, I don't know. To overdose, you think it would have to be a fluke? At this point, yeah, I think so. I'm able to like gauge like, you know, yeah. So you don't worry about overdosing? No. We select opioid overdose, and then we remove the med, and we select Narcon, and then we hit OK, and we just remove it out. Fentanyl is forcing treatment clinics into a new frontier. Fentanyl is much stronger than anything we've combated before. The Rapid Access Addiction Clinic, known as RAC on the streets, provides everything from mental health services to opioid replacement treatments like methadone and suboxone. The majority of people who are, are dealing with a substance use disorder likely have other conditions that are affecting them. They may not be necessarily just be psychiatric conditions, it may be the sort of um, psychosocial circumstances that affect them, lack of housing, lack of support, history of trauma, those things certainly impact substance use as well. We are unique in the sense that we are seven days a week, walk in, you don't need an appointment, you don't need a referral. 
So because of that, we have had people actually come from very far. We've had people come cross border, people out of province, you know, that have relocated here, either because they've heard about us or they're relocating because they have family that can help them. Lisa Shaw has been nursing at the clinic for four years, often arriving to work to this scene just outside its doors. What have you witnessed just over the last several years as far as what you see when you walk in in the mornings? Um, lots. I've, I've seen it get worse. It's really quite unfortunate. And it's not just fentanyl that's the problem. It's a complex mix of things in the drug supply right now. It's incredibly unpredictable. And it's their job to try and make things a bit more predictable for people like Amanda Bristol. You never really know if your next, the next thing that you do that is going to make you feel better. You, you don't know if it's going to be your last. Amanda's talking about the drugs she would buy on the streets, describing them as ruthless. You would be sick to the point you couldn't move. And that's how it keeps you in it because you can't go without it. And at the beginning, when I first started doing it, it would just make me throw up. So I don't know what it was that kept me, that actually got me addicted to it. And while she may not know what got her addicted to the drugs, she does know what's helping her get off of them. I take methadone, methadol, methadol D, um, and I like daily witness it at the pharmacy um, and basically when I was in my addiction um, I started off slow at a very low dose and they kind of worked it up so that I weaned off the drugs onto like a prescribed medication that helps me stay clean every day. It's important that we recognize where someone is on their journey and when there is the opportunity for them to maybe want to decrease or stop using to access treatment or just find out the options that were there and you know we certainly do collaborate with all the harm reduction sites to make that option available when they want to go. What's been the hardest part of this journey for you? Um, I think talking with my kids, not really wanting to tell them what's going on but I know they're old enough to know. Yeah. It's okay if you cry too. We all cry. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, how does it feel now though for, for you to know they see you getting better? Uh, my heart's filled with joy. Yeah. They're doing well, they're happy, and yeah. It's a long way from her deepest days in addiction, when she couldn't go for more than three hours without a hit. Did you have Narcan on hand? No, I kind of, the last going off, I didn't feel like I was worth saving. So I, I said if it was my time, it was my time. Because I couldn't go without it. My body, it needed, it needed something. I couldn't move, I couldn't, I couldn't talk, I couldn't write, couldn't anything. In, yeah, so I didn't feel like I was worth saving. And now you know you are. Yeah. Does it worry you, Sarah, at all? I've died six times now. <laughs> Sarah has overdosed six times. It's not the life she imagined. What's your situation? I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm a young adult, I'm from foster care, been on the streets since I was a kid, I'm from sex trafficking, so I don't know, hitchhiked across Canada, I'm here now, escaping an abusive relationship. She's also trying to escape addiction, coming to Vancouver in hopes of healing. I got on my Suboxone because I was on fentanyl heavy when I got here to Vancouver. So yeah, year, year by year, sober, good to go, done one little meth and crack binge. And then I don't know what happened a few weeks ago, but it was my birthday and yeah, here I am. <laughs> she considers these people her family. Corey has been on the streets since he was 13. What do you use for? Alcohol, leaves, crack of I was doing like a bow down a day and now I'm only using a point. And sometimes I can put something that looks like, that looks like crack in my crack pipe and I'll overdose. 
off of one puff. What do you think they could do better? <laughs> Bro, catch you when you're young. When you're there and they, they have doctors and everything around you and stuff, and they're just letting you slip through the cracks, and they're telling you, no, you slip through the cracks. Nah, man. Nah, man. It's all a joke. But the more we scream about it, nothing ever changes. What nothing do you want ever. to change, though? Now, now that you're not, you're not young anymore, what do you hope can change for you? Boy, you know I was sober the last year and a half, and this is my first, re like, this is my relapse. And I've been doing it a binge for like three weeks. And I don't know where it's gonna end up, like how it's gonna, you know? But me, man, I'd just like to have a great job, my own property, my dog's backyard, and then somebody that loves me. As you take a walk down these streets, you see a lot of people here, open crack pipes, uh, open needles, uh, lots of open open air drug use. And it's like this, it's been like this for, for many, many years. Hey guys, good, how are you? Excuse us. Vancouver Police Sergeant Steve Addison has spent most of his career on the downtown east side. You can see in there lots of, open, like just lots of drug paraphernalia. And says the department's approach to this neighborhood has been evolving. There's been a reckoning, a realization over the last number of years that continued enforcement, continually arresting um, drug addicts, uh, drug users, doesn't stop them from being drug users, doesn't stop uh, the crime from happening, and um, you can make an argument that it actually can lead to more crime. The police department supports harm reduction efforts like safe injection. Harm reduction puts the focus on people by putting in place policies and programs aimed at minimizing the negative impact of drugs rather than putting people in jail. We believe that um, there's merit in harm reduction, but we also believe that more treatments are needed for people's complex social needs. That includes treatment on demand, uh, more housing solutions so that people aren't living in tents on the streets here in the downtown east side. And until those wraparound services are provided, we're likely to continue into this cycle. And it's not just Vancouver that hasn't been able to solve it. There's cities up and down the West Coast, cities all over North America that are grappling with it. San Francisco, Portland, Seattle. Uh, if anybody had the solution, um, they would have solved it by now. It is a massive uh, problem that seems to really have overwhelmed uh, whatever we've thrown at it. And um, so what I've learned is we have to do more and we have to radically think outside the box to, um, to save lives. And making it so people can legally carry small amounts of some street drugs is one of those moves outside of the box. British Columbia is legalizing some illicit drugs starting in 2023. And I think also decriminalizing all aspects of homelessness and uh, drug use. So really get the police kind of out of this business and get the health and uh, mental health support there instead. Police rarely arrest people for having drugs and soon they won't be confiscating it either. Taking uh, $50 in, in drugs away from an addict who has those drugs for personal possession um, isn't going to prevent them from being an addict. Quite frankly, it's going to result them result in them going out to commit more crime. I take $20 in heroin away from you as an addict, you're gonna go and break into somebody's car to steal something to feed that addiction again. It's that vicious cycle. I mean, officers should not be reviving people from overdoses, right? They shouldn't be going after uh, drug users who are, who are just uh, have a health, and health issue. They should redirect the resources toward organized crime, go after the funding, go after the money that's made. We're working um, within our own agency, with partner agencies, combined forces, international agencies, um, we're, and we're having investigative successes all the time. Do you think there's enough progress is being made in actually finding those people and bringing them to justice. I mean, my, uh, so I also chair the, the Vancouver Police Board, and so we, we get a lot of information, but with fentanyl, you can mail 50,000 doses in an envelope. So to think you're ever gonna stop this coming in, you're not going to, and now that people can make it domestically here, like, to think you're gonna pinch off the source, it's not gonna happen. Why can't they pinch it off? I just, I think like it'll just resources. pop up somewhere else, like it's, 
like we've really tried that, <laughs> right? Haven't we? I mean, we put, well, we spend a million dollars a day here on policing, but that's a lot for a city of 700,000 people. How and, much of that is going at trying to stop this? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually know the proportion of it, but I do know that the police would much rather put a lot of their resources into the organized crime that you get in a major port city, but are often are dealing with much lower level stuff that in the end just people revolve through court systems and that's it's frustrating for officers as well. Let me just check on Stella. Sir! Hey sir! It's police! You okay? Okay, okay. You're you're passed out on the sidewalk. I wanna make sure you weren't overdosing or something. Okay, okay. Okay. That's what we do. Uh, a lot of the times down here, you walk, you, as, a, as a beat officer around here, you walk around down here and there's people sprawled out on the sidewalk. A lot of our time is spent checking on people to make sure they're alive. We can't say we've, we've seen success. We, we some, people, some lives have been saved, but far too many people have died. And Vancouver's chief medical health officer believes people will continue dying if they continue to get their drugs off the streets. Things are terrible now, and they've become terrible because of the highly contaminated illegal drug supply, which is only getting worse. And some of the other actions we've taken around the pandemic have made things worse. Well, we're now coming out of the pandemic, but we haven't addressed the illegal drug supply. We need to provide an alternative to the illegal supply of drugs. We're never going to address the crisis if we don't. Dr. Daly is referring to safe supply, a harm reduction strategy that provides people with their drug of choice. And it's already starting at Insight. And I think that's an important addition to it. You have people who are established and already feel comfortable with that service. It's a great way to introduce something new and safer for them. How are you doing that at Insight? Is, is, the, is the drug actually there? How, how does that happen? Yes, yes. People are given safe supply drugs to use at a booth at Insight. Uh, they get follow-up around that, and it's part of a sort of larger care program. We legalize cannabis as a country. And there were people concerned about the harms associated with that. And we're still in the process of implementing that, but we didn't see harms that people were worried about because of course people consumed cannabis before it was made legal. And you do it in a way that you also, if you legalize any psychoactive substance, what we've learned from tobacco and alcohol, you have to do it in a way that also minimizes the harms, discourages young people from using these substances in a problematic way. The city of Vancouver is already making moves to make some illicit drugs more available. We're not going to be selling all psychoactive substances from storefront outlets like we do for cannabis. Some of these substances are much more uh, 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 harmful. When people talk about insight and harm reduction services being enabling, I really don't think that they're understanding what drives catastrophic drug use in this community and other communities. It is shame, it is pain, it is stigma. Anything that tries to ameliorate those feelings is working in a positive direction around people's drug use. We're not being judgmental because judgment only drives people further into the shadows. Now, if I am somebody who's from San Francisco and I come to Vancouver and I say, hey, this is the city that's trying this. Mm -hmm. I wonder how it's working. And I take a right and I go on to East Hastings. I go, it doesn't <laughs> look like it's working. Yeah. Is it working? Well, Safe Supply is in its infancy, so we have, you know, a few thousand people enrolled in this program and the results from that, I would say, early test is, is good. Decriminalization hasn't happened yet, that takes place in January, so I would say watch this space. Insight's been around since 2003. Yeah. Drug overdose deaths are hitting an all-time high. Yeah. Some people will look at that and say, well, that doesn't work. Well, I would say that there is so much that is not working about our approach to drug use in this society and insight and supervised consumption sites are one of the things that is working. And we need to look at how to make those services more impactful, more meaningful, how to make them available to people. Bottom line, yeah. Sergeant, what needs to happen in this city to address the drug overdose crisis? Well, again, complex issues in a complex city. There's not one simple solution. Um, for a police agency, for the Vancouver Police Department, our role is enforcement. We target 
violent, predatory drug dealers that people are producing, uh, harmful opioids that are poisoning people in this city. We need greater wraparound solutions for people to address the complex needs, housing, um, poverty, substance use, mental health issues. They're all um, linked. What would it take, BC, to get you off of this? This, to be honest with you, a house, my own house. I've been trying for a long time to get my own house. Why do you say that? Why, why would a house help? Because it would be mine. I would take care of it. What do you think of the situation with drug overdoses and efforts to try and like... I think I've lost too, way too many people. I think I'm still struggling myself now. All these free needles, all this free, like... Oh man, I don't know. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You don't know if it's the right way to go? Like, you don't know if it's working? What do you mean by you don't know? I mean, I really don't think it's working. What do you think the answer is? Um... Honestly, I don't know. They, they're trying to give out fentanyl patches. They're trying to do all these different programs, but it's just—it's not this. It's, it's just not enough for people. We had a lot of hope when Insight opened. We didn't know it would take 15 years before we could even expand that service. But the nature of illicit drugs now is not anything like what it was back in 2003. We now know in British Columbia that our overall life expectancy dropped because of overdose deaths. That's been happening across the United States for a number of years. This means this is a problem that we all have to address. I am optimistic um, that we will change. You're optimistic even in the face of what is such a crisis that isn't slowing down. Still optimistic? Hope's the anchor. You don't have hope, you don't have anything. So, you know, I, I've always had that hope inside from my own life. And, I'll have that hope inside that we can change as, as people. JK, can I ask what keeps you hopeful when you've tried so many times? What keeps you hopeful? Um, there's a few things. Like, you know, I have been able to get some extended clean time. And that's the thing. Like, in, over the past few years, I have significantly more clean time than using time. It took me nine years to come back into the recovery program after being clean for almost four years. And I, I relapsed the day before my four-year cake because trauma hit me, brought back everything I hadn't dealt with. If you don't deal with your trauma, you're never going to get clean and sober. Bottom line. Bottom line. I mean, you know. And I... Guy says the bottom line on these streets, the drugs aren't going away until there is change outside of the downtown east side. You know, what you stayed because of the drugs. And I said, no, I stayed because of the support. There's a difference. It wasn't the drugs that were keeping me here. It was because people cared. And until we actually shift that into other communities where people care, then why would you expect them to go? I felt your glaring looks, your pointing fingers, you're shielding your kids away from me. And we have to break that.